This is part two, describing the tensile test and Hooke's law, and we're going to try and see if we can start up and describe what's taking place. Here we have the, a stress that's applied in the y direction, coordinate system we were using for this particular case at x here, y here, with z coming out. Okay, so far, our right hand rule x goes into y, gives us z, so that should be correct. We're going to look at this and we're going to actually treat this as being a real material. We're going to say it's a piece of steel, just plain old everyday carbon steel, which has a Young's modulus of about 210 gigapascals, give or take a percent, and a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.3. We can also look at this Young's modulus in a different unit system. It is also 30 times 10 to the 6th. PSI, and that gives us a very handy conversion. In fact, it's pretty useful to remember this as a, a value that you should know so you could do these calculations even if you were trapped on a desert island. Okay, so we're going to use our expression for Hooke's Law, multi-axial Hooke's Law, to find these three strains and straightforwardly find that uh, individual result. We know that sigma x and sigma z are equal to zero, so we can go through and cross those guys off. Right, and that's going to give us for e sub x, e sub x is going to be equal to minus Poisson's ratio times sigma y divided by e. And e sub y is going to give us sigma y divided by e. And e sub z is going to give us minus Poisson's ratio sigma y divided by e. And if we take these values right here and plug those in we can plug in this is equal to minus 0 0.3 times 50 and that's given an MPA to make it the same units we write this as 210 times 10 to the third MPA gives us the dimensionless quantity of 7.1 times 10 to the minus 5 and we remember that this is negative right there was a negative sign on there here we just have straightforwardly 50 divided by 210 times 10 to the third. That gives us 2.4 times 10 to minus 4. And this should be the same as the value for e sub x. And it's minus 7.1 times 10 to the minus 5. And we'll be sure that that's clear that that's a 5. Okay. Now, one thing to, to keep track of is in many cases I use e and epsilon essentially interchangeably. And we can do that if we're talking about deformation strains or distortion strains for the following reason. You remember, may remember this or prior example wherein we showed that in order to find the distortion strains, right, that the terms, the shear terms, are just the average of E12 and E21. Since we're just focused on the diagonal, it turns out E11 is equal to epsilon 11 e22 is equal to epsilon22, e33 is epsilon33. That's pretty easy. But even these, there's a direct relationship. And really, from this point forward, in most of the things I describe, we're going to be talking about distortion strains anyways, and we're not going to be worrying about that rotation. Also, by analogy to having a hydrostatic stress, it turns out that the values along this axis describe the dilation or the change in volume of the material. So dilation or dilatation and allow us to define a volume strain and the volume strain is delta is equal to the sum of E11 plus E22 plus E33 when this is equal to zero we have constant volume but in most cases when we have applied stresses the applied stresses if they are normal stresses if, if the applied stresses don't sum the, st the stresses on the diagonal don't sum to be equal to zero, then the strains probably won't sum to being zero. So we do have a change in volume, and we can actually find that change in volume for even relatively complex stress states. And we'll see an example of how to do that in the following couple slides. Okay, so we'll take a, an applied stress state that's similar to what we did earlier, except in this case, it's going to be compression. 
and the compression that we're going to apply is going to be described as here. So we have sigma equal to, and we have minus 50 and minus 50 in the y and the z direction. In order to make it correspond with this particular drawing, I can pick whatever axis I want. I have the power to do that. So I'm going to pick the one that matches. So I'm going to put y this way, and I'm going to put z this way, and clearly for right-hand rule reasons, that has to be x. So it appears that there are no forces in the x direction, or that we have plane stress in the zy plane, or the 3, 1, sorry, 3, 2 plane. So that's the stress state we have, and in this case it's equal compression, so it's equal biaxial stresses that are compressive, so we're actually squeezing this this way, and we expect that in the x direction there will be an expansion. So although, though we have plane stress, we don't have plane strain because we actually expect a change in the dimensions in the x direction. Okay, We can see that as summarized here. We plugged in these values. You can see them here. Right? And we can solve for each of these. Right? We can get this particular solution using the same values, 0.3 times 100. There's a negative sign here, and there's a negative sign here. So it's the 0.3 times 100 divided by 210 times 10 to the third. And that gives us a strain of 1.4 times 10 to the minus 4. This solution since the units are here in terms of gigapascals, this solution will give us minus 1.67 times 10 to the minus 4, and this one should be the same. It's minus 1.67 times 10 to the minus 4. Okay? So in both of these cases, in fact, we can compare these two cases. We can compare this case where we can find the actual dilation or volume strain, and it's the sum of these terms. In this particular case, delta is the sum of these terms, which is equal to minus 1.9 times 10 to the minus 4, and that says that this is actually squeezed to a smaller volume. Even though there is a corresponding distortion out here, it's not enough to compensate for the decrease in the dimensions in both the y direction and the z direction. And if we go back two slides, and go back up to this case. In this case, we had our strains that were equal to, and I have to get my pen back again. We had strains that were equal to minus seven point one plus. 24 minus 7.1, assuming that these are all times 10 to the minus 5. And that gives us a result of 9.8 times 10 to the minus 5, or about 1 times 10 to the minus 4. So even when we apply just a tensile stress in one direction, and there's a corresponding contraction of the sides, it's not enough. We actually do get an expansion in the volume. So there will be a change in the volume. If there's a change in the volume, that means that while the load is applied, there is actually a physical change in the density.